Welcome to the Funny Cause It's True podcast. I'm your host, Kevin McGeehan. The show is recorded live every other Tuesday at the Second City Hollywood in Los Angeles, California. Storytellers are either predetermined or chosen randomly on the night of the show to tell a true story based on different themes, and this podcast is a mixed bag of some of my favorites. The theme of this episode is parental guidance, two very contrasting stories of advice from a persuasive progenitor, which is another word for parent that I stumbled across in a thesaurus. Craig Conant describes how he was on the wrong side of a cringe-inducing testicular accident, and I recount how I was not invited to my best friend's wedding. But let's not dawdle. First up, Craig Conant. Parental guidance. Uh, I don't know if you could tell about my appearance, but I didn't have very much of it as a child. (laughs) My dad... Uh, to explain him, he gave me a buck knife every year for Christmas. <laughs> every year, I'm not kidding. He gave me fireworks at a very young age, and my mom would just give me bottles of Kool-Aid and say, behave, fill up, because that's my middle name. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And I didn't have very much parental guidance, and um, this story is about a backyard. I was working with my father, and uh, the back of the truck was full of cement. And at the front of the truck was 60 pound bags of cement. And he said, help me. And I was 14 and could hardly lift them at all. So I said, sure, dad, why not? And I would pick up the bags of cement, take them to the end of the truck, set them down, get down from the truck and pick them back up. And we did this for about an hour. And then it was on the last bag of cement. And I picked it up. And I didn't want to set it down, jump down, and pick it back up because it was heavy as fuck. And I did not want to do that. So I have it in my hands, and I jump off the truck, and I land. And the 60-pound bag of cement slips through my hands and lands on my left testicle. And it it felt not good. I just look at my dad and like it was this weird pain, not even like when you get kicked in the balls, it was just deeper than that. <laughs> in your soul. And I was just like, ah, like, I think I need to go to the hospital. And he's like, oh no, you don't, son. You'll be fine. So I don't go to the hospital and I go home and I go to bed. And I wake up the next morning and I go to go to the bathroom. And I take one step and I cannot walk. And thank God dad's at work because he would have said, just just walk it off. <laughs> like, dad, I can't fucking walk. And, uh, but mom was home, the savior, the nice woman that let me suck on her breast as a young, young man. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so I go, mom, I'm like, something's wrong. And, She's sweet. She goes, let me see it. And uh, so I show my mom my stuff, and she's just like, holy shit. And my left testicle was bigger than both of my balls the day before. It it was like literally the size of a baseball. Just just one, just the left guy. The right side was all right. I don't know why. So she takes me to the hospital, and I, I, I show the doctor, and he says the same thing, like, holy shit, like, <laughs> fuck, man. And he said, don't let that happen anymore, you won't be able to have kids. And uh, it hasn't happened since. So, <laughs> I'm all right. And, uh, but he says to me, and he just looks me in the eyes, he's like, yeah, you need to ice that every day. And uh, if, if the swelling doesn't go down in a week, we're going to have to drain it. And I was like, my, my ball? <laughs> he's like, yeah. And I was like, drain it like how? And he's like, we're going to stick a needle in it and drain the fluid. And I said, does that hurt? And he said, very badly. <laughs> and I was just like, ah. So I have like a week of my life to ice my ball sack profusely. And I am on it because I do not want needles in my nut sack, you know? And I am icing it every like half hour, just half hour on, half hour off. You gotta give it a cool down because the shit burns. It's fucking ice. And uh, like the whole week, my ball was still big. And then the, the day before, 
I go to the doctor, it's still big, and I'm just icing my nut all night long. It's like, fucking go down, buddy. Just please. I don't want to do this. And um, so I'm icing it, and it, it's like, I, I do believe in God, and I prayed, and my ball went down, and I, I went to the doctor, and I did not have to get a needle in my ball. But it still was pretty big for a little, a little while longer, and I had to keep icing it. And I had to, I missed like a week of school because of this, so I was icing my balls the whole time. <laughs> and I go back to school, and I would freeze these little Minute Maid juice boxes, not to drink, but to put on my balls in class when the pain got too bad. And I'll never forget this, but I was uh, in Miss Piper's reading class, and I, my ball was hurting very bad, <laughs> and I needed to ice it. So it's like quiet, and you know, reading time, so I'm unbuckling and unzipping and like getting out my lunch with frozen Minute Maid juices and I'm like going like this like, and it and it feels so good so the look on my face is like, oh and I just look over and this girl's just looking at me and I was like, no, no, no I'm not a pervert, my balls are just big and yeah, my parents helped me out with that Woo! Next up, me, Kevin McGeehan. So in May of 2008, I was in my car and I was talking to my best friend of 14 years, a guy named Lance. And Lance and I had not spoken in a long time. I was living across the country from him. And it had been a few months since we had spoken, but our bond was still very much there. And he called me to tell me two bits of significant news that he had never, uh, that was just out of the blue. The first one was, he was getting married that weekend at the Drake Hotel in Chicago. Also, he was going to be a father in two months. Now the kicker was, he was calling just to alert me to this, but he was also calling to say, we are not having anyone invited to the wedding. The only people that are being invited are going to be family members because this is a shotgun wedding slash ceremonial appeasement to some very conservative grandparents. And because they had a baby on the way, they wanted to make sure that they still kept money ready for that baby and not just on an extravagant ceremony. So no one was allowed to come. I was hurt and disappointed and sad. And I was so upset and I said, screw you, man. Who's to say I wasn't gonna be at the Drake Hotel this weekend anyway? And he said, please, if you could just abide by my wishes, we just, if I invite anyone, then it's going to hurt other people's feelings. So if you could just abide by this and not come to it. I said, fine, I will not come to your wedding. So we cut back a few years. Lance and I met when, uh, in 1996, when we were both working in the same restaurant. We found each other exceptionally funny, and we got along immediately, and we became the best of friends. Uh, we were products of a single mother, which is something that was near and dear to our hearts. So uh, we bonded over that. Uh, Lance, and I say this with assuredness, is the coolest guy I have ever seen in my life. He is uh, one of those guys that people just gravitate towards, and when he speaks, people are mesmerized. To know him is to be enamored by him. He is Fonzie, and by default, I'm Richie. <laughs> so, this is what epitomizes him as cool to me. Uh, we were in Peoria, Illinois for a show that we were doing, a very crappy improv show, and the guy who was running the place, he also owned the strip club that was next door to the theater. So he invited us to go over there, and what we thought was going to be awesome immediately and quickly turned sad. So we walked into this room, and here was the, here's the image. So there were two stages. On the backstage, there was this really buxom, vivacious woman dancing around, and there were about 20 guys in front of her hooting and hollering and just throwing money at her. On the other stage, there was a woman who was less endowed, and no one was standing in front of her, so she was basically just nakedly swaying in the music. Lance, we're all, we all want to leave. We, we don't want to be there anymore. It's kind of a, a dump. And... Um, <laughs> Right as we're about to leave, Lance says, hold on one second. And he goes and stands in front of the other gal and uh, watches her dance. And uh, they make eye contact and smile. Uh, and then uh, he gives her a little bit of money. And then uh, she leans down and kisses him on the cheek. And then he whispers something to her. And she smiles and she kisses him one more time on the cheek. He walked back over and I asked, hey man, what did you say? And he looked at me and said, sorry, 
That's between me and the lady. <laughs> uh, one day, I was on the subway in Chicago going to my restaurant job, which I hated so much. It was a Saturday morning. I did not want to go. And I'm sitting on the train, and I look out the window at the stop that we're at, and I see Lance walking on the platform. And then he sees me in the window, and he makes a beeline over to that window, walks over to me, stares at me, and then puts his hand up on the window. And then I put my hand up on the window as well. And we hold it for about five seconds, and people are starting to look at us, but we do not break eye contact. And, like, <laughs> and then as the train is starting to pull away, he keeps his hand there, and he walks with the train until it's about to go away, and then he lets go, gives me a salute, and then walks away, and it made my day better. So, <laughs> now in 2006, we had been friends for about 14 years at this point, and in 2006, I had some pretty big stuff happen to me, and I had to go home to help my mother in her time of need. In that time period, uh, there was some pretty big stuff that I had to do, and I needed help. And Lance said to me, if you need any help, just tell me, and I will fly down to Florida, and I will help you with it. I took him up on that, and I called him and said that I needed help, and without hesitation or, or pause, he just... He said yes, and he came down and helped me with something that he admitted later scared the shit out of him. But he persevered and he came through and he wrote my mother a letter a few days before she died. This beautiful letter that just uh, thanked her for his and my friendship, assured her that he was going to take care of me when she was gone and that I was always welcome in his family. It was a beautiful letter that I still have to this day. After he had done all that help for me, my mother said to me, and here's where we get parental guidance, she said to me, he really came through for you, and you better do right for this guy in your life. So now we cut back to my car where I'm sitting there and stewing about the fact that I can't go to his wedding, and I'm just thinking about me and my feelings. And then I realized something where when I faced a death, he did not question me. He just came through and helped me. So when he faces a birth, I could do nothing but extend the exact same courtesy. So I called him the next morning, and I said, I am not going to come to your wedding, but... And this is non-negotiable. I am going to come to Chicago and I'm going to be there if you need me. I'm going to be there the day before and the day of. So if you have to go do piddly errands or if you need anything, I'm there. I'm an extra set of hands. And he said, thank you. And we went, I went to Chicago. We went to DSW on the, in the afternoon and we had a great time. Uh, you know those little stockings that uh, you put on your feet when you're trying on shoes? He put that on his big head and walked around the store. And we, oh, it was so funny. And we laughed and laughed. Uh, and then when the day was over, he... Um, we went back to his place, and he was about to go off and get married, and as we're talking to each other, it was a very lovely talk, and we said some nice things to each other, and then right as I'm about to leave, I looked at him and I said, remember this? And I put my hand up, and he smiled at me, and he said, yeah, and put his hand on mine, and we held it there for a few seconds until it was awkward. <laughs> and then I pulled it away, gave him a salute, and I walked away, and he is now the father of two. Aww. If you're curious about anything that Lance and I said that day when we put our hands up to each other, sorry, that's between me and the lady. Aww. Aww. Yeah. That's it. That's our show. Special thanks to our storyteller, Craig Conant. Also thanks to Josh Callahan, Mark Warzeka, The Second City Hollywood, and the Comedy Podcast Network for producing the show. If you would ever like to see the live show, Funny Cause It's True is every other Tuesday at 10 p.m. at the Second City Hollywood, located on beautiful and mildly scary Hollywood Boulevard. You can like Funny Cause It's True on Facebook to find out upcoming show dates and themes. All the past episodes are available for free download on the Comedy Podcast Network and iTunes. If you've listened this far into the episode, chances are you either really like the show or you didn't like the show and the stop button on your listening device is currently malfunctioning. If you are the former, feel free to leave a comment and a rating on iTunes conveying any of the good feelings you may have had about the show. The more feedback, the better. Comments are currency here in the iTunes world, so the more favorable comments and ratings, the more the show can reach a broader audience. The next live show is Tuesday, April 24th at 10 p.m., and the theme will be college. So come out, put your name in contention, and maybe you'll get chosen to tell a true story on stage, and from there, get chosen to be on the podcast. My name is Kevin McGeehan. Thanks for listening. For more funny stuff for your eyes and ears, 
Go to ComedyPodcastNetwork.com 